Good morning, First Christian Church. Is this not the most glorious spring day? It's going to be so nice. I can't believe this. Be sure you get outside today before the rain comes. If you realize that this is kind of like the first time that we can see each other without this mask, just think what this is going to mean to Dr. Flower. She's been preaching to a conversation con- congregation that looks like we're going to rob a bank. So today she actually gets to see our reactions, our smiles, and hopefully not our friends. I have good news and bad news. The good news is, remember last week when I asked you to turn off your Wi-Fi or power down your phone? It worked great. So the bad news is I'm going to ask you to do it again. Until maybe at some point we have an IT person that shows us another way to do this, please just turn the Wi-Fi off or power down your phone. And I know a couple of you told me that they don't like to turn off their phone. If you would come with me for just one hour, open your hearts and hear the word of God, you are not going to miss your phone. I can guarantee it. Um, Announcements. Cheryl Satterfield still is looking for help. Her sign-up sheet is outside for children's church and Sunday school, so please consider helping Cheryl out. I know it's it's a hard job with the children, and I know you hate to miss, miss your Sunday school class and, and church, but maybe you could see it in your hearts to help us just a little bit. I want to welcome all of you this morning to our service and to Facebook out there. I want to welcome any visitors that are here this morning. Actually, I met a couple. So I would like you to sign the attendance record. It's usually on the edge of your pew towards the center. If you would sign it so we know you're here. And for visitors, I forgot to bring my bulletin with you, but if you'll notice, there's a tear-off sheet on the side for visitors. If you would fill that out so we know that you were here, and you can just place it in the offering tray later in the service. First Christian Church has always been known as a loving, sharing, and caring congregation. Loving. It's who we are. Sharing and caring is what we do. So if you will stand with me right now for the reading of scripture and then remain standing for the invocation and the recitation of the Lord's Prayer. Today's reading comes from Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to his name and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. May the Lord bless the readings of his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, everlasting Father, the one who loves us more than we love ourselves. We come before you today humbly to worship you for simply who you are. We praise you for all of the things that you've done for us. We we praise you for all the things that we know about, but we have to worship you because you are indeed worthy Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit into this service so that this service is what is pleasing in your sight because it's not about us. It's all about you. And Father, we need you. We need you every hour. We need you in our lives. We need you in our children's lives. 
We need you in our grandchildren's lives. Lord, we need you in the schools. We need you in the government. Lord, we need you in the police patrol cars. Lord, we need you every step of the way. Lord, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for protecting us from seen and unseen dangers. Father, thank you for holding us close to you. Thank you for keeping us on the narrow path. Lord, there is none like you or beside you. And we praise your holy name. In your son's name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I forgot the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> I need like a reminder or something. Yeah, Kim, I need you to help me out here. That's what she's up here for. <laughs> Got to blame somebody else. Please re recite with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I am sure that you have heard the saying, you, <clears throat> you only get out of something what you put into it. <clears throat> Excuse the frog in my throat. <clears> throat> Let me start again.
I am sure all of you have heard the saying, you only get out of something what you put into it. And when I hear uh, this saying, it reminds me of the story about this fella who went to church with his family. As they were driving home afterwards, he was complaining about everything. The pews were uncomfortable. The music was too loud. The sermon was too long. The announcements were unclear. The building was hot. The people were unfriendly. And just went on and on, <coughs> virtually complaining about everything. <coughs> Finally, his very observant young son said, <coughs> Dad, you have to got to admit, it really wasn't a bad show for just a dollar. <coughs> if, <coughs> if you're watching the service from home and you would like to uh, give your tithes and offerings. You can mail them to the, here at the church at 915 South Maple, or you can bring them by the church during the week. Will the deacons come forward to receive our tithes and offerings? <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see your financial blessings in our life and help us to give thanks by being generous and giving back to you for your work. 
and asking for your blessings on each gift and giver. Amen. This is from one of the daily devotional books that Nancy has called Jesus Calling by Sarah Young. The idea is to imagine that this is Jesus just talking to you, giving you a little pep talk, as it were. Relax in my peaceful presence. Do not bring performance pressures into our sacred space of communion. When you are with someone you completely trust, you feel free to be yourself. This is one of the true joys of friendship. Though I am Lord of Lords and King of Kings, I also desire to be your intimate friend. When you are tense or pretentious in our relationship, I feel hurt. I know the worst about you, but I also see the best in you. I long for you to trust me enough to be fully yourself with me. When you are real with me, I'm able to bring out the best in you, the very gifts I have planted in your soul. Relax and enjoy our friendship. In John 15, 15, Jesus said to his disciples, I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. As disciples of Christ, we acknowledge that all are welcome at this communion meal. Would you please repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. We remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take a few moments now for silent prayer. Heavenly Father, as disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, help us to trust you and him freely, with joy and without pretense. Show us the gifts you have given us and help us to use them to glorify you. Amen. Can we do our joys and concerns? I'm sure a lot of you have seen on Facebook about Gary Melton, and if not, let me tell you, he was in an automobile accident in Hot Springs. His car was totaled. He has three broken ribs. He has pulmonary contusions. He is full of bruises. He's in a lot of pain. His hands went through the windshield, and that you see when you see a picture of him, they're all wrapped. So he's in a great deal of pain, as I mentioned, but... He has the most wonderful nurse, Brenda. So he should be coming home any day. He's home now. Great. That's wonderful news. We often say at this time, let's pray for those in our nursing home and retirement centers that can no longer be at home. But I think once in a while we need to be reminded who this is. So today I'd like to share that with you. In Hillcrest Nursing Home, Doris Jones and Kenny Wright. Maple Esplanade, Claudette Cowan, Charlotte Gregory, Betty Hoffey, and Shirley Hodges. Newton County Nursing Home, Kenny Hoff, Kenneth Hoffey. And in Somerset, Jeannie Iveska and Sandra Reynolds. In other facilities that are out of our area, Joey Roth is at Grand Village in Fayetteville, and Tom Reed is at Highland Health Care and Rehabilitation Center in Bella Vista. We need, I think, I was surprised when I saw this list, so I hope this changes your prayers just a little bit to recognize who are in the nursing homes and retirement centers. Joys, it's just good to see you all here and healthy. 
Now let's just take a moment of silent prayer to lift up those that I've just mentioned and for any of those unknown prayer requests. Amen. This morning before I came over here, I um, was thinking about this pastoral prayer. And I just had it on my heart to ask you that if you believe in prayer, if you know God hears you, to stand with me in agreement as I pray, please. We don't know who that siren is headed towards. We don't know what this next week will hold. But we know the one who knows the end from the beginning. We know the one who's already there before that siren arrives. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come before your throne of grace. Lord, we praise you. Yes, we do. We praise you. We magnify you. We exalt you. We lift you up because you are God all by yourself. Father, I thank you that you are able to meet us wherever we are. You are able to give us some of our wants and fulfill all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Lord, we have many spoken and unspoken requests, but Father, first of all, I ask you to forgive us of the things that we do that are not pleasing in our sight. Lord, forgive us for our impatience. Forgive us for our short-temperedness. Forgive us, Lord, for not being loving towards each other. Lord, forgive us for not giving the way you would have us give in so many situations of our time and our talents, as well as our tides. Lord, touch our hearts and show us how we can better walk to please you, how we can move in the direction and make the impact in this world that you would have us to. Lord, because I know that you did not call us to be one of your own so that we could rest on our laurels, so that we could sit by and idly watch the world go to hell on a handcart. Father, you called us to go out there and to do the work of the ministry, to serve others. Thank you for that opportunity. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for the people that are in here. Yes, we are a loving church. I figured that out when I got here, before I got here. And I said, my goodness, how can they love so much? Well, they can love so much because they're so full of you. Lord, continue to bless us individually as well as collectively. Lord, bless us in such a way, a way that we want to bless someone else. Let us not be a reservoir of your blessings, but a channel where blessings flow from you to us. Hold us close to you always. Lord, touch our lives in a way that there will be no mistake that God is here. God has been here. And God will continue to be here in our lives. Father, and for those generations that come up behind us, our children, our young people, our grandchildren, Lord, cover them with your love. Cover them with your protection. Lord, we never know where, where danger exists, but you do. Lord, we don't know what, what, what life holds for us, but you do. Well, Father, I bless your holy name because I know no matter what situation we find ourselves in, you have already been there before we get there and are waiting with open arms to comfort us, to keep us, to hold us. Thank you, Father, for simply who you are. Thank you for all the things that you've done and all the things you continue to do. In your son's name I pray, amen.
The words to today's scripture will not be on the screen, so I invite you to open your Bibles. There uh, should be some in the pew if you don't have yours. To the book of John, chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. <clears throat> I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything that you have, uh, have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all that you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you do, that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of, not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the word of God to the people of God. Praise be to God. At this time, if you haven't already, it's time to release the children for children's church.
Lord be with me as I present this sermon. Lord, I thank you that my congregation doesn't have eggs so they can throw at me, throw them at me. Uh, I ask them to pray for me as I tell this story. Amen. Okay. On Thursday, Jesus prayed so as they may be, that we may be one. He prayed for the unity of the church, the unity of the body. And I think we can look around at the different denominations and different beliefs and so forth and say that, well, we've kind of moved away from that. We're not into unity, it seems. And we divide ourselves over so many things. How a person should be baptized, uh, whether or not they need to have first communion if they're, in, you know, or if they're Catholic versus Protestant. We divide ourselves in so many ways. Well, here is another example. On Thursday, May 6, 2021, Saddleback Church in California ordained three women who have served on the ministerial staff for a number of years. Their pastor is Rick Warren, who is probably best known for his books, The Purpose Driven Life and The Purpose Driven Church. These women were ordained at Saddleback despite the church's affiliation with the Southern Baptist Convention, which prohibits female ordination. A quote from a theolo theology professor on this occasion, he said, this is an example of, unbiblical, an, of an unbiblical development. Adding to this, he, I mean, in addition, he said, the time to leave is now. Now is the time to find a sound congregation. Wow. In our scripture today, Jesus prays what has been called the consecration prayer, the magnificent prayer, the prayer of the, redeem, of the departing redeemer, the faith farewell prayer. And in this prayer that's found in John 17, there are three parts. There's direct personal concern for the disciples, a concern for their protection in the world, a concern for their consecration or sanctification, that is their holiness. I cannot imagine how someone, oh, actually I can, how someone would tell people that it would be better for them to leave the church than it is to stand by while women are ordained in the ministry. I find this interesting because, as you know, or those of you that do know, that I was raised Baptist and I'm always interested to see what's going on back in the old denomination that I used to be a part of. And I feel like now is the time to talk about my being a woman in ministry with this congregation. We've never had that conversation. I know when I was called to this church, um, that was my major concern because I looked at the list of pastors that you've had in the, previously and they were all males. Apparently, the media was only focusing on the fact that I happen to be African-American and the majority of you are not. Uh, do you remember we have photographers laying on the floor up here and taking pictures and articles and the guy came in from Sweden to talk to the pastor who's black pastor who's pastoring a church in the most racist town in America? I mean, it never seemed to end. But what I was concerned, I forget the race stuff. I was more concerned about the gender stuff because that had been such a hurdle for me in my ministry. Now, when it, first of all, it didn't make sense that God would call me because, you know, Kim, he had tons of good people. So why would he call old Joanne, okay? I was quite content in my academic pursuits, you know, at the university, I was um, department, academic department chair for the Department of Public Health at East Tennessee State University for seven years, and I supervised about eight men that either had MDs or PhDs. I mean, you know, there's nothing like supervising smart, crazy people, amen? 
Um, I also was finishing up my career in the Navy, in the Reserve. So on one end, you know, one week in a month, I'm putting on the uniform and I'm going down there and I'm being saluted and if they don't salute me, what's wrong with you? Don't you have that uniform on? Blah, 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 blah. You know, the whole bit. You know, I'm playing the game. Um, you know, it was great. <laughs> and then something happened. Now, I will admit, I was not a very careful, what, I'm, what I mean is I was not in the church probably the way I should have been. I would go and then I'd get kind of burned out with whatever, and I wouldn't go anymore for a while. But see, I had been baptized when I was seven, and I knew the Lord, and I knew the power of prayer. So whatever went on in my life, I knew when it was time to go fleeing back to him. But I never thought about the issue of women in ministry. As a matter of fact, I had never seen a woman participate in communion or serve as a deacon until the first time I went to a Disciples of Christ church. Never saw it. Women were not to do that. I remember as a young woman sitting in our church and a woman went up there and to the pastor and said, I've got a call to preach. And he pretty much said, off with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any direction for that in the scriptures. So, you know, enough of that. And I thought, God, how humiliating. But nevertheless, this was the church that I continued to set into. There I am, a very non-traditional example of a female in a church that wanted to embrace something else. Oh yeah, it's, it's been an interesting route. Something in my life changed. Something in my life began to change. Well, it kind of started with my mother because in, I was um, living in Washington State, happily living in Olympia, Washington, about 30 miles from Mount Rainier, and on a clear day, I turn around in my backyard and there's this big snow-capped volcano just sitting there year-round. And then when we would drive, we would go and we would see the Olympic Mountains, snow-capped year-round. And I loved it up there. I loved it. I never planned to leave. Working as an environmental epidemiologist for the state of Washington. I was the person they sent out when a group of people would get sick from what was suspected to be an environmental exposure. And because I had the background in environmental, I'm trying to figure out if the cancers happen merely by chance. We get in there and run the statistics. We, I mean, it was what I had wanted to do all of my life. And then my mother was given no symptoms, three to 11 months to live. She had small cell carcinoma of the lung, oat cell carcinoma. I remembered it from school, a type of lung cancer that they have a very difficult time with. Three to 11 months to live. And so I made a sacrifice, I said, okay, Lord, I don't want my mother to die by herself because you see my father had died years before um, at 43 from colorectal cancer. So if you're not getting your colonoscopies on time, get your colonoscopies on time, amen? I see Carol smiling. Everybody get their colonoscopies on time. Well, anyway, so I didn't want my mom to die by herself, so I made the decision to leave Washington State and take a job back east. I was a torn between CDC and East Tennessee State University. And the bottom line is I went with East Tennessee State University because they called me first. Otherwise, I'd be at CDC. Well, anyway, so I'm back there in Tennessee. Six months after I get there, my mother passes. Okay, and I'm trying to get my life back. But something was going on. Something was going on inside of me. Quite frankly, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. You see, because the entire time my mother had been sick and she was angry with me and we never got anything right between the two of us. Uh, and I'm fighting with God and I'm telling him, I know that you can heal her. I have no doubt. So why ain't you doing it? Why ain't you doing it? Why isn't she not, why are we, why are we seeing not the cancer being contained, but it's actually spreading further? And the angrier I got with him, it seemed like to me the closer we became. Because, you know, I was taught in church, be a good church person. You don't get mad at God. Oh, I was hot. I was hot. 
Because I prayed for that stupid dissertation down there at the University of Texas, right? And God came through. This is my mother we're talking about. This is something you really need to come through for. And he didn't. And I even said, I'm not going to praise you. I'm not going to do anything. I am so mad at you because you took my mother. But that shows you that I was a spiritual baby, an infant. Like the scriptures say, not ready for solid foods because I thought it was my will that should be done, but it's his will that must be done. But he will be with you every step of the way. So anyway, so things started to change, you know, I, I mean, you know, time ticking on, and I realized I was getting up in the middle of the night, going in the bathroom, reading scriptures, like, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? What is this pulling? What is this drawing? What is this thing that's on me? So I went to my pastor, and I said, to explain to him what was going on, his response was, well, just don't fight it. Well, what kind of, what kind of, Comfort it. Well, just don't fight it. Well, <laughs> fight what? Fight what? And then I noticed some other things were happening, like, like I, I, there was a seminary in the town, Kim, and I didn't even know there was a seminary in the town, but suddenly, when they were doing their call my phone number was the only one they had because they kept calling me. What do you want, people? There was that. And so little by little, by inch by inch, and then there was another thing, and like I would find myself talking about scriptures, and the people would say, I mean, I'm not talking about any informal setting. I was just talking about scriptures, and somebody would say, oh, I could listen to you talk all day. And the next person, I could listen to you talk all day. What is wrong with you people? Where are you reading from the same script? Who is giving you this? Who's feeding this? This a plot. You're being used by the Holy Spirit. I knew that much. So I decided to go to seminary, at least take a class or two, because I'm still over there supervising smart, crazy people, just to see if the ceiling would fall when I showed up. Amen? And it didn't. It turned out it was a Christian church independent seminary. You know, we stoned it, Stone Campbell folks. We got over here, we got in the center, Christian Church Independent, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and our other cousins are Church of Christ. Very good. So there I am at the seminary trying to make sense of what was going on in my life. And little inch by inch, little by little. I began to understand that scriptures are true when they when it says our God is a consuming fire. Yes, I was being called into ministry. Now, how in the world could that be possible? I mean, 1 Timothy in 2 and 12 says it all. Paul wrote, he said, I do not per permit a woman to teach or assume authority over men. She must be quiet. Wow. Wow. That's pretty stiff. So what did I do? I needed an answer. I called my mother-in-law. <laughs> she was a praying woman. I said, I think I'm being called in ministry, but what about, what about what Paul said in Timothy? What about what he said in Corinthians? What about that? How could he call me? How could he use me? And she said, I'm going to turn this over to my prayer group. She had a prayer group. They're down there praying hurricanes against Houston away from Houston, and she told me, she said, but what did Jesus say? Uh-huh. Well, Jesus did have that moment at the well with that woman, Samaritan woman, and she went in and told everything about him. Then Jesus did meet another, some more women in the garden, and they went and told. I mean, could that be possible that he actually uses women to spread the word, I couldn't make sense out of it. I said, this can't possibly be me. Hmm. But nevertheless, the calling didn't stop. The calling continued. And so what I came to understand is that Paul in his writings, 
different epistles for different churches, different cultures, different situations. And so do we hang our hat on just one teaching? Because Paul, back in that scripture in 1 Timothy 2 and 12, he says, I mean, just to elaborate, he says, therefore, I want women, men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves, not with elaborate hairstyles, guess he hadn't heard about braids, or <laughs> gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Okay, Kim, we need to go over share and care and get our next few dresses. But with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And then he goes on, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved, how? Through childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. So therefore, I guess if you hadn't had any children, you're just going to hell on a hand cart, right? No, I'm not here to mock the scriptures. I'm just simply reading what it says. This role of women in ministry. But see, we talk about 1 Timothy 2 and 12 was used to just beat me over the head. My pastor finally told me, he said, you don't know how to stay in your place as a woman. You don't know how to stay in your place as a woman. Wow. And I'm thinking in another world, I'm giving orders to men. But now I don't know my place. But here is the other things Paul says. Over there in Rome, which I can't wait to talk to the uh, open door class about the 16th chapter of Rome, Paul tells people who are going to form a church or form a church in the most powerful city in the ancient world that I'm sending a woman your way. Her name is Phoebe. And I commend her to you. And in addition to that, he also talks about Priscilla and Aquila. And that's important. It's a marriage, it's a couple that's married. But Priscilla's name, I think they appear seven times. It's a pair. Priscilla's name appears first five of those times. And in Greek writing, that is indicative of the most powerful of the two. So you've got that. You've got an apostle that is named Junius which they believe was a woman because every place else in Greek writing, she's a female, but she's an apostle. And Paul talks about these people. He continues, he said, they labored with me. They co-labored with me in the gospel. And when you look at that verb, it's the same labor, word, verb that he used when he talks about his work with Silas and with Timothy. So they weren't just making cookies and tea. They were actually out there on the battlefield. Wow. In addition to that, 1 Corinthians 12, 4, 13. Oh, uh, and Ronnie Ramsey, I know you don't have your power chainsaw with you today, but I'm going to put these scriptures on Facebook. <laughs> By the way, I wanted to talk to you about that. I got a dead tree over there. But anyway, um, I'm a, no, no, no. I just want everybody to know. I'm going to put these scriptures on Facebook so you can look them up and read them yourself. So you understand. Over there in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about that God's people have these gifts that were given to them by the Holy Spirit for the purposes of building each other up. And let's not forget on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, Peter quoted the, uh, quoted the prophet Joel. He says... This is what Joel said. He said, in the last days, God says, I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both male men and women, I will pour my, out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. But I think what really nailed it for me, when I got into the study, 
And Charlie, you guys will probably hit it back there in Galatians 3 and 28. And Paul writes, same one who wrote all this other stuff. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free. There are nor is there male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Wow. We are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, I've come to the conclusion that God calls who God wants to call. I believe he uses, however, uses us however he sees fit. I believe that our God is a consuming fire. I do miss, I would not have picked this. I certainly, you know, there's some people in seminary, I think, well, you know, I want a career where I stand in front of people and use a microphone. Well, I didn't need that. I wasn't looking for that. I was quite content with everything else I had going on. They had even told me at one point that I might make admiral. But I lay it all down for him. I put it all down for him. I do whatever he wants me to do so that some might be saved. Because it's not about me. It's the fact that he blessed me to still be on earth to serve him, because that's what ministry means, is to serve. My pastor told me that uh, I had so much respect for him until that point when he told me that I didn't know how to stay in my place as a woman. I can tell you the journey has been excruciating. It has hurt me to my soul, because it wasn't like I was looking to do something, to get a title or whatever. I just wanted to please God. I just wanted to do what I felt called to do. But when he told me that, I shared with him, I said, you know, I said, if God had the power to call me, he's got the power to put me wherever I need to be. I don't have to go out burning bras and kicking doors open to be a woman in ministry. <laughs> Some people think that's funny. <laughs> if God had the power to call me. He's got the power to do whatever needs to be done. And sure, there were days that I thought it would never happen. But one way my mom blessed me before she left this world, she told me, she said, Joanne, she said, when you were little, about five or six or somewhere in there, she said, you came home from Sunday school and you preached to my mother and my father about Hosanna, about Palm Sunday. And she said, they said they could see the Spirit of God all over your face. And so they decided that it was their responsibility to mentor you. And so as a little kid, I remember all the rest of the grandchildren would be running around tearing up stuff, but they would call me and say, my grandfather called me Johnny Ann, Johnny Ann, come over here and read this passage. And I don't remember what those passages were, but I think my heart does. No, I don't know why God calls who God calls. When he calls them, I mean, he could have called me way before I got tied up with Texas and all that stuff. Why didn't he call me way back? Why didn't he let me go through all that before he called me? Well, he called me that, and somebody had to remind me that uh, Sarah and Abraham did their best work when they were senior citizens. Right, Kim? Yeah. We don't know why. I don't understand why. But I feel as your pastor, you need to understand what I'm thinking and what validates, or maybe you still say not doesn't val invalidate my being your pastor. No, Southern Baptist is, has a special place in my heart because I'm from my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. And the seminary is right there in Louisville. As a matter of fact, I took my Hebrew classes from them because I said, what I'll do is I'll sneak in, take their Hebrew classes, then become this radical female preacher, Holly, that, and I'll say, oh, yeah, and I went to Southern Baptist. So, no, that, that didn't all work out. Hebrew, a horrific language to learn. But anyway, 
God is. And I stand before you today to tell you God is. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come before these people. Lord, as difficult as that journey has been, Lord, I thank you that you were with me every step of the way. No, I couldn't see the end from the beginning, but you knew what you had called me to do before the foundation of the world, how you planned to use me and where you wanted to use me. Lord, I thank you for the opportunities to go to foreign shores and praise your holy name and to preach your word. Lord, I thank you for Kenya. I thank you for China. I thank you for Haiti. I thank you for Cuba. I thank you for Chile. I thank you for England. I thank you for Spain. I thank you for Portugal. <laughs> Father, And when it seemed like there was no, no way anybody could use me in these United States, you said, uh-uh. I got something else for you to do. Lord, I ask you to put your hand over my hand so that whatever I lay hand, my hand to is what you would have me do and how you would have me do it. Lord, bless this church. I love them, Lord. I thank them for calling me. I thank them for knowing you. In your son's name we pray, amen. So at this time, we will have our invitation. If you stand with us, please. Um, this was the time if you wanted to join our church or become a member or if you wanted special prayer to come down. Um, I just got word that Brenda Melton, her cousin died last night. So the family's really dealing with some issues right now. They need our prayers. They need our support. So please remember them in prayer even after today. And also, just FYI, if anybody wants to talk about women in ministry or anything like that, <laughs> I'm available. I thought about writing a, uh, uh, a book about that, Ronnie Ramsey, but I figured you and your chainsaw will probably cut it up. But, um, <laughs> um, but one thing I will tell you, my husband gets mad at me when I use him as an example for anything, so I'll probably get in the doghouse. But I remember when I told him that uh, I think God was calling me into ministry. I was afraid to tell him because, you know, I didn't think he could handle one more thing from this non-traditional wife, you know, running off the ward, all this stuff. So I finally told him, and he said to me, that is between you and God. That is between you and God. And I thank the Lord for my husband. Let me do the benediction. Run back here in the back. <laughs> Try to catch you guys on the way out since you took off your mask, finally. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we thank you that you do do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we may ask or think. Now unto you, who is able to keep us from falling, who presents us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore, let the church say,